Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, lawmakers release a budget proposal. We'll get reaction from legislative minority leaders. We'll learn about a program that encourages underprivileged girls to pursue science and engineering careers. And we'll look at a local exhibit of micro dwellings. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The state Senate has released a budget proposal and ideas for a new child welfare agency continue to take shape. Here now to discuss these and other issues are Senate Minority Leader Anna Tovar and House Minority Leader Chad Campbell. Good to see you both again. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Let's you start Simons. with this budget proposal coming out of the Senate here. Uh, thoughts? Well, it is a very slim and trim budget that the Senate Republicans have put out. Again, we, I just finished a three-hour appropriation committee that addressed uh, the budget itself. Um, you know, we had less than 17 hours uh, to review this budget, and I'm sure that the public had less of an opportunity as well. Um, in appropriations, in the three-hour meeting, we had zero public participation. So it's very concerning how fast uh, this budget is moving um, and again no transparency process there was no public participation it lacks quite a bit of things in this budget from uh, over in the other chamber now what you've seen of the senate proposal what you're expecting from your own uh, group of fellows there uh, d d thoughts uh yeah this budget just doesn't pass the, the the test i mean it's it's not a good budget for the state at all um it's not close to the governor's budget it's probably not going to be close to what we're proposing from the house democratic side and it's probably not even going to be close to what I think the speaker wants to see in his budget. But it, it's severely lacking funding in a couple of key areas, and that's education, one, and then child welfare, CPS, child protective services, uh, child support services. There's just not enough money in there to get the job done. And after all we learned last year about the CPS disaster, all the failings of that agency, the fact that the Senate president is pushing out a budget that doesn't address that is simply unacceptable. Yeah. Thirty-one million dollars for with the CPS successor, whatever it will be. Five million, five million dollars for the transition. I think that's mostly a placeholder here. Governor wants eighty-one million. Um, is this just uh, the Senate president and Senate Republicans saying this is a starting point? We can move from here. No, I believe it's just an exercise in futility. I mean, this definitely throws a monkey wrench into the whole budget process. I mean, when you have a uh, budget that comes out today that does not tackle the issue of creating jobs in Arizona, doesn't fully fund um, and, and have a, a solid commitment of an of a investment in public education. And as Representative Campbell mentioned, uh, the CPS, uh, you know, placeholder. I mean, if we learn something from last year um, in the fiasco is that we have to address this issue properly. Um, and coming out with a budget such as this really leaves us vulnerable uh, to what happened last year with our uninvestigated cases. The Senate version, I think, is $9.2 in spending $100 million more than last fiscal year. That is an increase, is it not? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, I, the math is an increase, definitely. But, but it's not enough. And, and we're coming out of recession. We've had five or six years of, of massive cuts to our infrastructure, massive cuts to education, most notably. Uh, and, you know, for, for all the, the touting that Governor Brewer does of her track record on education and She's education governor. Uh, she's cut funding for schools more than any governor in the history of the state. And Arizona cut funding for schools more than any other state did over the past five years. So we've got to catch up. We've got to reinvest. And $100 million simply isn't going to do it. We have money again. We have needs. And so we need to use that money to fulfill those needs, just like you would in your personal budget. If you couldn't, if you hadn't been making money and all of a sudden you started making money again and your kids needed some things for school or needed clothing or food, you would make sure you started buying those things. You wouldn't just sit on that money. You would spend it so your family was better off. There are some things in the Senate bill, uh, Senate's uh, proposal, though, that go against the governors in a, in a curious way. Highway user funds. I mean, it mm -hmm. sounds as though the Senate's saying, all right, we can transition some of that money back to where it's supposed to be going in the first place. Governor's proposal had nothing there. Well, that, that's an important issue. And I think you have an agreement with all parties at the legislature on the HER funds. I mean, we have an infrastructure that is crumbling. We have outside of Maricopa County as well, we have streets, roads in our cities and counties that are falling apart and that are, prevent, are, that are actually a safety hazard for many of our constituents. This also, the HERF issue itself addresses the issue of tourism. We want to attract uh, people to come into our state. We have to have the infrastructure 
in place. And again, this issue, um, the HERF issue, it has bipartisan support, um, you know, from people there at the Capitol and from cities and towns. So it's definitely a step in the right direction if we want to move Arizona forward. How many steps in the right direction <laughs> does there need to be for Democrats <laughs> to say, you know, you, you're going to wind up with option A, option B, and maybe an option C. Yeah. But none of those options are going to be Democratic proposals. At what point do you choose one or do you just say, can't go there? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, we have to see. What we would like to see, though, is, is for us to be at the table like we were last year uh, around the Medicaid debate and the budget debate last year. And what you saw come out of that debate last year was a very moderate, common sense budget that started to reinvest in schools again, started to reinvest in, in job creation. Uh, we put that together with Democrats and Republicans. And I think that's what the people of the state want. I think people are sick of partisan politics, which we see in the voter registration numbers. They're sick of one party dominating, be it the Republicans here or Democrats somewhere else. They want the parties to work together. And when we do work together, usually what we get is a better result. And I think we could do that again this year with the budget. Is that something, though? I mean, we've talked about education and, and it, nothing in here for the Common Core assessment. Absolutely, positively nothing. Um, that's that has to change. I mean, the governor well, I, is big on this. And I know a lot of folks. Is that the kind of thing where, like Medicaid last session, you could find yourself in a coalition making change. I believe education is the key for us to move our state forward. And this issue of the Common Core or lack of the funding um, in the current budget is is a big issue. Um, currently, this the, in the past week um, in the Senate, we've essentially killed four anti-Common Core bills. And that was joined together with Democrats and Republicans. Now we see a Republican budget that says just the opposite, that says, we're against Common Core. Again, it does have this budget has no money for the assessments, um, so it, it really is detrimental to our schools. They've invested millions of dollars, thousands of hours and time in training our teachers, and yet we're you know they're taking an extreme position right now of not moving our educational system forward. The other issue as well in education is not properly funding in, in public education. We see bills not only on the House and the Senate that give funding to private uh, schools. So essentially we're handing over taxpayer money without any accountability and encouraging. We have our, our superintendent of public education. Um, he's the superintendent of public education, not private education. Um, he is essentially giving money to private uh, well, schools. Yeah, it's, it's certainly making robocalls uh, to, to that effect. You got education, you also have CPS successor here. I'll just call it the successor yeah. for now because we don't know what it's going to be called. That could be a position in which Democrats, again, could find themselves in a coalition. We're seeing like maybe some draft work coming up here. What, what are we hearing here? Uh, again, it's in the initial stages. So I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I think there's some agreement amongst uh, a certain group of Republicans and the Democrats that we need to separate the agency, obviously. We need to do some reforms in terms of how these cases are handled, both you know, from the intake and, and once they proceed from that intake process. And we need to give money. Uh, and if you look at this budget that, that Senator Biggs put out, uh, again, there's not enough money for caseworkers. It doesn't come anywhere near close enough in terms of meeting the funding priorities that the governor's outlined, and that I think most of us on the Democratic side agree with when it comes to fixing CPS. Uh, but I also think the one thing that we really need to focus on, and this is where I think the Democrats and a group of Republicans could join together, is focusing on some of the preventative services that would help keep kids out of CPS in the first place, and most notably is child care subsidies. If we can fund that program again, that will allow these single mothers to go back to work and have their kids in child care as opposed to leaving them home with the boyfriend that they don't know that well or somebody else. And we see these cases all the time, ends up in neglect and abuse. We need to put child care subsidies back into the budget should be a priority, and I think we can get that done this year. It sounds like things like uh, annual external audits and citizen oversight, these sorts of things could be part of the plan. Good yeah, ideas? Absolutely good ideas. If we're gonna learn from our mistakes, we must address the, the real issues. But I agree with Representative Campbell. Again, these are you know draft legislations that are coming out, but again, the, the issue of preventative and intervention services needs to be tackled. And again, the issue of neglect, what what the focus is of this new agency. Is it going to be solely on child safety? Is it going to be, again, incorporating um, child prevention services and intervention services? The, today, I mean, it's a perfect opportunity for us to set the reset button on CPS, and we need to do it jointly. 
um, and work together on this process. Before we go, uh, new registration, <laughs> voter registration numbers are out. Yeah. And independents are number one, which is a surprise. Republicans, number two. Democrats are not only number three, they've lost, you guys have lost ground even more. What is going on out there? And how do you, I mean, we understand. How do you address it? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's two things going on. I think this is a trend we're seeing nationwide, first of all. The independent affiliation is growing as people, I think, are getting fed up with, like I mentioned earlier, partisan politics as we traditionally see it. Uh, and I think a lot of that's coming from D.C. and it's filtering down to the local level. But here in Arizona, I think the reason you see independent numbers going up and both party numbers going down, and ours more so than Republicans, is younger people are voting, I mean, registering as independents more and more. And even though they're probably going to register as an independent, they're probably going to vote more with Democrats than they do with Republicans because they're probably more progressive on the social issues. So I think that's the trend we're seeing here, as well as, and, and, and Sir, Senator Tovar has something to say about this too, same with Latinos. I think Latinos are registering more as independents as opposed to traditionally registering as Democrats. But just because they're registering eyes does not mean they don't affiliate in many ways with Democrats more so than Republicans. So I don't think things have changed as much as people think they have. Absolutely. You had the issue of t uh, SB 1062 that I think will garner much attention and, and have people come out and register. As Representative Campbell said, yes, there are more independents that are being registered. But again, these the issues that are being presented at the state capitol, these extreme political you know, bills that are being presented will engage not only the Latino community, but in include the LGBT community, come out and voice uh, their disagreement with, with what is happening at the Capitol. And we, again, we have great candidates that are running for office that will engage voters and have them come out and turn out the vote uh, here in Arizona. I would just add one thing too. I, I'm happy that people are registering as independent. I hope they look at parties and stop just voting according to party affiliation and actually look at candidates. I think that's better for our side than their side right now in this state. But the one thing I wanna say is I hope these independents are gonna start voting in primaries because that's where these elections are being decided and that's why we're seeing more extremism and more division because you have a small group of people, especially on the Republican side, controlling the outcome of these elections and they do not reflect the vast majority of voters. Last point, you, that's, and again, this is what you're thinking is happening out there, what you're hoping is happening yeah. out there, but what is happening is people are falling off that Democratic Party uh, bus. Why and what do you plan to do to address it? Well. As far as the Democratic Party, we do have a plan to go out and engage voters and register them as well. But again, it, like Representative Campbell said, you know, people need to be engaged in the primaries. I think that's uh, that's the focus of turning Arizona um, blue. Uh, you know, in the coming future as well. But it, again, it's about looking and holding our elected officials accountable. I mean, it's one thing to say that you support education, it's another thing to vote. So holding our public officials accountable, getting engaged in the process, that's essentially, I think, what every Arizonan wants. All right, we gotta stop it right there. Good to see you both. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Tonight's focus on Arizona technology and innovation looks at CompuGirls, a program for adolescent girls that combines computational skills with key areas of social justice. The program was founded by Kimberly Scott, Women and Gender Studies Associate Professor at ASU School of Social Transformation. Scott was recently honored at the White House for being a STEM access champion of change. Congratulations on that honor. That must have been very nice. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Let's talk about CompuGirls. Give me a definition. It's a technology program secondarily. It's really focusing on getting girls ages 13 to 18 to redefine themselves and use technology in the process. 
And I noticed it was, the quote here was, culturally relevant tech program for girls. What does that mean, culturally relevant? And since then, we've really thought about that and we talk more about it being culturally responsive, mm. whereas we're trying to provide girls with the skills so that they can find themselves. So many of the girls come from us from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, we have girls from group homes. We have girls who are truants. We have girls who are teen mums. And what we find is that a lot of times other social institutions have written the girls off. They assume that their identities are fixed and that they can't be changed and they can't be taught to do something other than what they are uh, defined at at this given moment. And so what we do is have lessons and activities so that the girls can question their identities and ultimately transform them and then in the process further their communities. Is, so, is it a question of raising the bar or just making a different bar to, hurt, to hurdle? I think it's making a different bar, not necessarily to hurdle, but a different bar in order to bring not only yourself but your peers into a different type of playing field. And uh, again, it encourages computational thinking. What does that mean? I think it's a fancy way of saying critical thinking. Oftentimes people will say computational thinking refers to uh, getting students to think more like a computer. But I think it's more about how to approach a problem in a way that uh, makes sense. One of the young ladies said that uh, after her experience in CompuGirls, she may not be able to know everything how uh, a hardware software works, but she has the thinking skills to figure it out. And I think that's a great example. Is it the situation though where some girls come in and, and, and you just know that they need to be convinced that they can do it. It's, they probably can do it, but they need to be convinced they can do it. In our um, experience, most of the girls know that they can do it. In fact, that's why they're there, but they haven't had access to the resources or the opportunities to do it. Yeah, so that's an important thing. And as, as well as, uh, again, I'm, I'm using some words here from, from your uh, stuff, techno-social analytical skill. Yes. What does that mean? Well, um, we are trying to get girls to be techno-social change agents. And so it's not only seeing your identity as a leader in your community, an individual who can change the way the community functions and improve it, but use the technology to engage in that process. Talk about the technology. What is used? And so we use iLife, for instance, so the girls create video documentaries. We also use Scratch, which is a, a, a software produced by MIT, and it teaches the girls how to create games or simulations. And then we also play around with virtual worlds in which the girls create culminating projects. And talk about uh, this uh, open sim technology, is this for, that's like SimCity type stuff, correct? Yes, we have used SimCity. Yeah, and do they enjoy this? Do they find it, is it, do you have to keep pushing a little bit, or is it kind of thing where you have to slow them down because they're so excited about it? They're typically very excited. In fact, when I first started the program in 2007, I wanted it to be uh, enjoyable, and so I limited the time. And it was the girls that said they needed more time, and they would inevitably ask the mentor teachers who are responsible for doing the teaching to come in on Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> Good luck with that. I, yes. I was mad. Uh, the peer mentoring approach is, what does peer mentoring approach, what is that? So what we do is, um, as the girls progress through the courses, we teach them how to um, not only be accountable to themselves, but to the group as a whole. And so part of that is having the girls uh, identify their strengths and share it with the group and teach other group members how to identify their strengths. And, and, and again, is this the kind of thing that works in conjunction with regular schooling? Is, is it regular? How does that dynamic play out? Um, here in the state of Arizona, and we are the mother site because we do have a site in Colorado, a couple sites in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Here in Arizona, we typically offer our programming during school breaks. Um, so it's fall break. In fact, we have a, a group of 40 going right now during spring break. In and, uh, Colorado, however, they have integrated the program uh, sometimes within the school in eighth period. Interesting. When you talk about underprivileged girls or girls from under-resourced school districts or these sorts of things, what exactly are you looking at? What kind of girl is, if there is such a thing, the typical girl involved in the program? And that's a really good question. There really isn't a typical girl per se, but what we found is many of the girls um, have not necessarily come from um, two family households. Um, as I indicated earlier, some of them have come from group homes, mm -hmm. and so they're in transition. Um, some of the girls don't attend school regularly because they feel that the school doesn't trust them. And then we do have some girls who are the stars. What we do is not accept a girl based on her GPA or her academic achievements, but based on her willingness to engage in the program. Well, with that in mind, how do you assess 
uh, how they're doing. I mean, how, how do you to move it a lot? I mean, are there tests? Are there guidelines out there? How do you assess? Oh, no, not tests. We do yes. not do tests. <laughs> okay. and, and I think that's part of the appeal. But we do have mentor teachers who are following a curriculum that I co-created. And there are sp specific benchmarks um, throughout the curriculum. And in addition, we have the peer mentors, many of whom are individuals who have graduated from the program. And they come back and volunteer their time. And they give a lot of one-on-one -on -one or one-to-five uh, interactions with the girls, saying how they're doing. Doing. We also demonstrate to the girls some of the more successful projects from the past and then they can gauge their progress based on their assessments. Do some of the more successful girls from the past come back and help out? Absolutely. Some of them come back and help out. Some of them also help to publicize the program. Um, when recruitment periods, uh, many of the girls, both in Colorado and here, will go out on the, the campaign trail, so to speak. In addition, uh, many of the girls have had the opportunity to present with me at national and international conferences. For those who come, do t maybe a, a fractured family in a way, but for those who do have relatives or family, what kind of reaction are you getting from them when they see the girls doing this? Wonderful. The parents and caregivers have been exceptionally supportive. At the end of each of our courses, and we presently have three courses, the girls organize a showcase. Mm. And we call it a closing ceremony, and we invite community leaders, in fact, you're invited if you'd like to attend, <laughs> okay. and their parents and grandparents and grass top and grassroot leaders, and we get some wonderful support. I know you mentioned this, 2007 was when this uh, kind of started, and this was your this is your baby here. Yes. Uh, was there one thing that that got you off on this? I mean, obviously it's a great idea, it's a good uh, inception, but was there one person, one thing that where you said, "I got to do this"? There are many things, but it, it, duh, I guess the biggest moment for me was when I was teaching in a fourth grade classroom back east in what was considered a high needs district, and I was consistently and regularly depressed by how so many adults did not believe in the children. And in their, their disbelief, they prevented them, I felt, from many times having access to rigorous curricula, to high expectations, and then ultimately to them fulfilling their achievement. Now you've changed that. Do you see the world having changed a little bit along those lines, or is that still out there? I think the world has changed, and I think that resonates with the point that um, occurred at the White House affair, yes. that there were 10 of us who are doing very similar work in terms of trying to engage a broader community with access to STEM. Well, uh, congratulations again on the honor by the White House. Uh, continued you. success with CompuGirls. You're doing great work. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. In tonight's Focus on Sustainability, we take a video tour of a micro-dwelling exhibit. Micro-dwellings are very small homes that are often built with salvage material and are designed to have positive benefits on the environment. An exhibition of micro-dwellings is on display at the Schemer Arts Center and Museum in Phoenix. Videographer Juan Magana recently visited the exhibit. The Schemer Arts Center is presenting an exhibit of micro-dwellings. Each builder is creative. It's all do-it-yourself products. The way that the builders approached this exhibit was with a guideline of having to create something that was 600 square feet or less. Many of these builders have used recycled or repurposed materials. Many of them have also used found objects. As you can see, we talked about found objects. This steam shovel has been repurposed and is now a pizza oven. Uh, every weekend he is offering pizza on site that's been baked in the oven of uh, the Bay City Street steam shovel. This building was designed by Dan Dwyer and it's all out of styrofoam. Most of them will be uh, taking down and then transporting to another location where they will then hook up plumbing and electricity and that kind of thing. But yes, some of these buildings are designed so that you could actually live off the grid so to speak, and live more simply. Well, this dwelling actually is called the Beetle Box, and it pays homage to a mid-century uh, architect called Al Beetle, who lived and worked here in Phoenix. I think most of the dwellings have been done for very personal reasons. Uh, a lot of them you will see are uh, studio spaces, so, or an outdoor space like the Beetle Box to extend um, you know, their indoor living, the urban living, 
to, uh, to be more outdoors and that kind of thing. This dwelling was actually built as a studio for a landscape architect. The design that's so unique about this is that it's all meant to be indoors, outdoors. This is an exhibit of what can be done in order to sort of live off the grid. The collected micro dwellings will be on display through March 23rd. For more information, check out SchemerArtCenter.org. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, it's our weekly look at state politics with the Arizona Capital Times, and we'll talk to Congressman Paul Gosar about the latest issues on Capitol Hill. That's tomorrow on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.